In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How many of you, if you could look at all of the jobs that there are to do in the world, might pick one out and say, man, I really don't want to do that one. <laughs> do you have a job in mind that you wouldn't want to do? Sort, sort of um, messy jobs come to mind, things that none of us would want to take on. The job that occurred to me this week that I wouldn't want would be to be the public relations director for the Pope. <laughs> Wow, what a brouhaha this week he has had. It seems that the Holy Father Francis has a propensity to engage with atheists and agnostics as we would expect him to want to do. Uh, and his task always is to try to put a human face on the church to sort of take away some of the fear, the stigma that those on the outside have of, of the church on the inside. And, he seems to always get himself in trouble with the best of intentions. Can you, you know, just imagine how this conversation with this Italian journalist might have gone? Something like, a, Holy Father, you don't really believe in hell, do ya? <laughs> Leading question. <clears throat> to which I believe he might have said something like, Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if the compelling love of Jesus was such that we didn't even have any need of such a place as hell? Innocent enough answer, right? Except the headline the next day said, overturning 2,000 years of tradition. <laughs> Holy Father says there is no hell, etc., etc. <clears throat> wow, and all of the Vatican handlers had to scurry and say, well, he didn't really mean that. <clears throat> the problem, of course, is that the culture is not very informed uh, as to what Christian beliefs actually are. And a part of the problem is that neither are the Christians, you know. It's a good thing that we've got uh, Susan helping to pep us up with some good Methodist hymns today. Because, <laughs> you know, there's... Um, anybody ever read the book Rainy? It's about a North Carolina Southern Baptist girl who marries an Episcopalian and she goes to church with him for the first time. And she says, I didn't know none of their hymns and neither did the regular people. <laughs> So the culture is not always in on what we do. There's that terrible, terrible joke that you've all heard before. One little boy says to the other, what's this Easter thing all about? And the enlightened little boy said, well, Easter is when Jesus comes out of the tomb. And if he sees his shadow, there are six more <laughs> weeks of winter. Almost as bad as that in a case where life is as uh, humorous, perhaps, as fiction. There was reported in the Washington Post this week that an NPR announcer, sort of getting everything wrong, uh, said um, in a little piece on Easter, Easter is that occasion on which Christians believe that after Jesus was crucified on the cross, he went straight to heaven, skipping purgatory and hell. <laughs> wow, that's just wrong on so many levels, isn't it? <laughs> First of all, we believe and say in one of our most ancient documents, the Apostles' Creed, that Jesus descended into hell. Uh, and, of course, by that we mean the place of departed spirits. Not necessarily some lake of fire, but a place where those who have gone uh, before are sleeping, as it were, according to the old Hebrew notion of things. And some of the most ancient Christian icons for Easter depict Jesus going down into this cave, this entrance to the place of the departed spirits, and taking little Adam and Eve by the hand, and all those who had gone to the place of the departed, he leads them out. There is an ancient Easter homily that was written by St. John Chrysostom uh, in the third century. And it is a, a sermon to accompany that picture, that icon. And he's saying to these who have departed and are in uh, perdition, come, let us leave this place. What we Christians are 
proclaiming boldly today with a billion or more people throughout the world is that what we say in the creed is something that we truly believe. We believe in the bodily resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the culmination of all that we hold dear. It is consistent with the whole witness of Scripture from beginning to end. The God who prepared a people to receive him in preparing Israel, uh, not only to uh, receive his truth, his teaching, his moral precepts, um, but also to be a light to enlighten the nations. And in the fullness of time, uh, this Jesus, who is God in the flesh, came into the world to share all of our humanity at his birth, at his life, at his temptation, at his suffering, at his death, and today as we celebrate also his resurrection. The tender details of that first Easter morning were recorded for us in St. John's Gospel that we just heard a few moments ago. Mary Magdalene and those faithful women go to the tomb to do their duty to prepare the body of Jesus that had been hastily buried because it was the eve of the Passover for a more dignified burial. Now notice it is dark, and when they get to the tomb, it is still dark. This sort of um, goes along with the Hebrew notion that the new day begins at sunset, not when the sun comes up which means that all of those wonderful little Easter sunrise services that people all over the country went to this morning, while quaint and sentimental, don't quite get the historicity of it. If you get there by the time that the sun has come up, you've missed it. <laughs> and I actually had an experience that was pretty symbolic of that in my um, early teen years. In the little town where I grew up, there was a um, community tradition that on a little lake, which was a backwater of the Waccamaw River, all the denominations would gather together for an Easter sunrise service. And the morning that I remember in particular, the Baptist and Methodist had already gotten there. They were singing their hymns to get everybody ready. And the Episcopalians were walking down the hill with the torches and the processional cross and all the vestments they could find. <laughs> and uh, the sun had come up. And it was getting higher. And we hadn't started. Why? Because the preacher wasn't there. <laughs> the very handsome, debonair, Presbyterian minister who was to be the preacher that year had not shown up. Was he deep in meditation? Was he still hastily writing his words of wisdom? No. In just a few minutes, his 1970s era station wagon, built by General Motors with the artificial wood grain on the side, <laughs> comes screeching up. Out he gets, fresh from the masters at Augusta. <laughs> He had mistimed how long it would take. <laughs> but back to Mary in the dark. Why is this such an important tradition to remember the tomb is empty? There's no body there. The grave clothes put on the left and on the right at the head and at the feet. What do we mean by that? Why is it essential? We mean that Jesus assumed the totality of what it means to be a human being, the entire human experience. He is, as St. Paul put it, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. He is the prototype, the pioneer of that which we hope and expect and long for. Perhaps in our postmodern time, it is helpful to wipe out of our memories or our imaginations something like the resuscitation of a corpse, uh, something that could um, be in a bad movie, you know. Um, not that at all. Still historic, still real and physical, but keep in mind or take into your minds a metaphysic that is beyond human experience a supernatural once and first offering. Secondly, the resurrection of the body prepares us to live as resurrected people in community. Another one of the things that we say in the creed is that we believe in the communion of saints. And the resurrection of the body means that we have hope not only in this life, but in the life of the world to come. 
Those that we have loved and who have gone before us are being raised to a new, resurrected, glorified body as Jesus was. Those of us who are grieving during this season because we are near losing those that we love have the hope and the expectation that we will join them again in a greater and more glorious day on that other shore. And so Easter and the resurrection, uh, the resurrection life uh, prepares us for a future, but it also prepares us for life now. Life now, living in community. Let me say a few words about that. I've got a friend who loves to annoy his wife every time that um, she says, you just have to have the last word. He always responds, no, I don't. <laughs> Along those lines, there's an interesting play uh, by John Paul Sautre. I've never seen the play, but I've read about it. The name of it is Secret Session. And in this play, three people, two women and one man, all of whom have uh, died in unusual circumstances, largely because of their shameful lives, the consequences of that, uh, they have ended up in some eternal place, all three of them together. And they're so filled with their ego and needs to self-justify that they never listen to the other and spend the entire play trying to convince the other two that their death was not really their fault and they are not to blame. And it goes on and on and on and you can just feel the Sotra existential angst getting higher and higher, right? And the last line in the play, as the curtain comes down, one of the characters shouts, Hell is other people. <laughs> well, for us as Christians, it's exactly the opposite. Heaven is other people. The great Cistercian monk Thomas Merton has a wonderful quote. He says, Saints do not seek holiness so that others will admire them. They seek holiness so that they may admire others. That is my proof text sometimes for the divinity of Jesus. You know, there's that passage in the gospel that says, And seeing the crowds, he had compassion on them. Think about the last time you were at the mall, people watching. Was compassion the first thing that you felt? We're not always at our best amongst the crowds. But saints are those who are prepared to learn to love others in spite of our faults. We recently went through a Lenten series in adult formation here at Church of the Good Shepherd on reconciliation. Uh, using some of Desmond Tutu's principles of truth and reconciliation. And in that series, towards the end of it, uh, many people began to talk about the hurts and pains uh, that they had experienced through others' uh, deeds and words that were hurtful. And then they talked about the glorious sense of forgiving uh, and moving forward with peace. And none of those people just sat in their rose garden and came to this notion on their own. Every one of them, without exception, said, I came to have that sense of new life, peace, forgiveness through this community. This place where, with word and sacrament and serving others and laying down our lives for the one who laid down his life for us, we learn new ways to live into our resurrected life, both now and in the world to come. Do you remember the old series, Cheers, that was set in a bar in Boston? What was the tagline for that song that was the theme song for that? You want to be where everybody knows your name. Mary Magdalene doesn't have a clue who Jesus is. She thinks he's the gardener until he calls her by name. And in an instant she calls out teacher and wants to cling to him. He says you can't cling to the old way of knowing me. There is a new uh, resurrected transcendent way of relationship that's coming about now. Go back. Proclaim. Teach 
the other disciples who've already gone back, you know. They, that's interesting, isn't it? The, the two disciples who were there see it and they just go home. But Mary is the one who goes and proclaims the truth of Easter, the first apostle of Easter. We have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. We at Church of the Good Shepherd remember that our Lord himself said in the gospel, I know my sheep and am known of mine and I shall call them each by name. On this Easter Sunday, may you hear our Lord's voice, risen and victorious, inviting you, step by step, day by day, into new and risen life. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen.